Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Dave. And I want to talk about um, how I changed my mind about something that I believed in really strongly. Um, and that's that I used to think that record and playback tools like Selenium IDE uh, were not worth using unless you were explicitly going to use them to export code and then write your tests in code. And so back in 2009 is when I first got started with test automation. And um, I first started in test automation with Selenium IDE. And uh, at the time, um, I was new to programming. I didn't have a background in it, uh, with the exception of an intro to programming course in college. Um, and so at least I had that going for me. And, uh, and so I was working on a team of a pretty standard makeup that you would come to expect. It was a team of um, non-programmers who were tasked with automation. And they were using Selenium IDE to try to accomplish it. And they had created uh, swarms, huge, massive amounts of tests with Selenium IDE. And they were uh, very difficult to maintain. And they were very brittle. Um, and this was my first experience with the Selenium project <laughs> and with Selenium IDE. And as a result, I formed a lot of um, opinions from the, those bad experiences. And uh, at the time, I, being new to test automation, without any prior, prior background in software testing or programming, um, I was looking for as much knowledge as I could find. And I was uh, fortunate enough to go to a conference, uh, the Agile Conference in Chicago in 2009. And um, the fun fact is that um, Selenium came out of ThoughtWorks in Chicago. Well, ThoughtWorks in general, but Jason Huggins, the creator of Selenium, lives in Chicago, worked at ThoughtWorks. And um, he actually showed up and uh, crashed the last uh, day at this conference. Um, so I got to meet him and also the uh, then maintainer of Selenium IDE, uh, Adam Goucher. And I basically was telling them my struggles with Selenium IDE. And I said, ah, it's just so hard to find enough information and be a non-programmer and being thrust into all of this. The best I can find is that you use Selenium IDE to write some, to capture some tests, and then you export them to code, and then just dig in and start figuring out how to code and, and write te a test framework and go from there. And Jason Huggins said to me, um, yep, uh, that's, that's what you have to do. It's really hard. And keep going, and you'll, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I did that. I went back to work, and I took everything I learned, and I kept working at it and kept being frustrated. And eventually, things started to make sense and started to work. And I was able to actually eventually achieve success with Selenium. Um, and that is what w was the bedrock of where I am now, was that experience, that bad, frustrating experience with record and playback tools. Um, and I've gone on to do a lot of things with Selenium. Um, I've written quite a lot about the topic um, with my weekly newsletter and my book. And the only mention of Selenium IDE in any of my content um, specifically is how to use Selenium IDE to export the code. <laughs> and and it, there have not been any necessarily positive mentions about the tool. Um, and um, along the way, uh, aside from writing the books and, and uh, doing various things in, in a professional capacity as a consultant um, and helping companies successfully do automation with Selenium, I uh, became the program chair for Selenium Conference for a few years. And one of the, uh, one of the roles of that job is to uh, help with talk selection. And uh, you do this long enough, and you start to see a lot of the same ideas that people submit, thinking that it's a new and unique solution to a problem. And what I've realized was that um, over time, a lot of people were trying to share how they've solved this problem in their own way, but this problem I'd already seen solved several different ways before. And so what I've started to realize is that I think everybody is, um, they mean well, 
They're trying to just do solve the problems that they have with the tools available, but they're all effectively recreating the wheel. And um, I think that uh, this is partly what changed my mind, this idea that, well, if, if the problems have already been solved so many different ways, why can't we just solve them once and in a way that's not just approachable to people who know how to code, but to people who aren't comfortable with that path. And so that's where tools like, uh, I think Selenium IDE, Record and Playback can really uh, have an interesting place. And uh, the way that I start to ref uh, refer to Selenium IDE isn't necessarily as record and playback because I think that it's actually more than that. Um, and I want to reframe people's thinking around record and playback because I think that there's a lot of negative uh, association with what Selenium IDE used to be and their experiences with it and a lot of the stories that have been created in the industry. And so the, f the term that gets used a lot now is codeless. And so uh, that also seems to trigger a negative reaction with people. Um, but I want to share uh, a comparison of Codeless to things like NoSQL. Uh, the idea that not only SQL, people think NoSQL meant no more relational <laughs> databases with SQL. But it's, you can use SQL, you can do things beyond that. There's new technologies you can augment uh, relational databases with. Uh, or, and do non-relational databases and so on. It's just, there's still SQL is kind of the point. And then serverless technology. Um, servers aren't going away, um, but a lot of the complexities of, of all the infrastructure is abstracted away so you can focus on the relevant parts of what you're trying to do. And so I think that Codeless fits in there. There's a lot of code. <laughs> I can show you so much code in Selenium IDE if you want, but I'd like to remove the barrier to entry for, for people so that they can accomplish so much more and just focus on the task they're trying to accomplish as opposed to solving the, the meta problem of building uh, and solving these problems. And so um, also to kind of complement this, um, this thesis that I'm putting forward, um, there was this article earlier this year from the Creative Product Hunt, uh, Ryan Hoover. He talks about um, the rise of no code and he talks about no code, codeless tools in the con, uh, context of uh, software development. And so, whoa, that went fast. Um, and so I'll leave you with this quote. He says, predictably many criticize and judge those that use no code tools while they come with trade-offs. It's inevitable that more products will be built or at least MVP'd without writing code, including by programmers that can code. And I'm actually seeing this within mature companies with test automation uh, that leverage things like Selenium IDE to augment their test automation even though they already have phenomenally mature um, test automation in code. And so I posit that the same thing that I'm talking about with test automation is also happening in just product development. And um, I think that it's helpful to have a rubric. Uh, I, if you've seen some of my previous talks, I kind of kind of fancy the idea of being able to have a, a way to uh, quantify and understand a topic so that you can know what you're, what, what is good basically. And so Angie Jones, uh, she inked this, she penned this uh, blog post, the 10 features every codeless test automation tool should offer. And I think it's a good litmus test for whether or not a tool is worthwhile. And I want to step through each one briefly, and then uh, from there, kind of segue that into some key features and highlights of what we have in Selenium IDE and the direction we're going that I think really speak to this list. And so the first one uh, is smart element locators. So um, it's, it's the most, talked about topic in all of uh, test automation, it seems like, besides page objects, especially at these conferences. If it's not that, it's about locators, because without good locators, our tests won't work. Um, but historically, when you write test automation, you write your tests with a single locator. And with a good tool that's worthwhile, it should ideally do more than that, use more than just one locator. 
um, and be intelligent about potentially retrying if the first locator wasn't successful and, and go from there. So that way if a test runs and it just, if the UI changes slightly, the test shouldn't just break, especially if the functionality is still there and if a majority of the elements are still present. The next one she mentions is conditional weighting. And so the other thing besides locators and page objects that's often uh, talked about quite a lot is um, weight strategies, synchronization within your tests. And in Selenium specifically, there's always this conversation around implicit versus explicit weights and which is better, whether or not to mix them and so on. Um, but a good codeless tool just hides this from you. Like it just should do it for you. Your test should work. It should be able to conditionally wait the appropriate amount of time. You shouldn't have to add any sort of sleep code yourself. You shouldn't have to force the test to wait a hard-coded amount of time. It should just do the right thing. And then um, control structures. So sometimes you want to do more sophisticated things with your tests. Instead of just having it be purely procedural, maybe you want to introduce some sort of control flow structure where you can conditionalize it, or maybe there's repetitive things that need to happen in your test and you want to have some looping structures. So a good tool would also have that. And you want to have the ability to add easy, reliable, powerful assertions. So not just asserting elements on the page potentially by their text or by some attribute tag, um, potentially being able to do more than that. And then modification without having to redo everything. So a lot of people I've talked to, uh, from the business perspective, they uh, actually mo a lot of people in general uh, who hold on to this old story of Selenium IDE, they view the tests that come from record and playback tools as throwaway tests. So a test that works now is great, and then when it stops working, instead of trying to fix it, just throw it away and re-record it. Um, and I think that we can do a lot better than that uh, with, with codeless tools. So a good tool will give you the ability to make sure that your tests are maintainable over time. And then um, having the ability to, on that same vein of maintainability, uh, have reusable uh, steps. So being able to take parts of one test and potentially, if it needs to be used in many, many places, have some form of abstraction. So cross-browser support, I think, is arguably one of the biggest things that's uh, critical for a good codeless tool. Um, it's one thing to be able to just capture a test and have it run on your single browser, but you want to be able to have it run cross-browser. It's table stakes uh, when it comes to test automation, um, especially with, uh, with browsers. And so um, reporting, that's also important. Um, I think that you want to be able to, when there is a failure, uh, understand why it happened without having to dig into the app and, and try to recreate this issue, especially if the, the failure is transient, if it doesn't always easily reproduce. And then um, the ability to insert code. So have some form of an escape hatch if you've reached the limits of what the tool can accomplish. And a lot of times you see this with just JavaScript execution. And then uh, continuous integration. So being able to tie all of this into where you fit in the development workflow within your organization and your team. Um, because all of, all of this is for really for nothing if you're the one that has to run this manually. Um, but if you can tie this all into uh, automatic, automated execution with continuous integration, then, then it all works. It's all worth it. So um, Selenium IDE. Um, I feel like uh, if, if, any, if anybody, if any audience would know what it is in advance, it would probably be everyone here. <laughs> so um, the thing I want to highlight about it is that if you haven't seen yet, we have a new website. Um, we've rewritten the docs for Selenium IDE, and we've, uh, we're constantly trying to improve it, but I think it's a huge upgrade from what was there before. So do check it out um, and uh, let us know what you think. And um, so now I'll just talk about a, f a few highlights that I think are really cool and, and uh, make Selenium IDE something really powerful and I think correlates really strongly to this top 10 list. And so the um, first one is within the concept of smart element locators. So um, this box here, I'll zoom in, 
um, it demonstrate it shows the fact that when we record in Selenium IDE, um, we capture not just one locator, but, but many locators. And we have this thing called locator fallback. And with locator fallback, uh, it basically means we'll try the first locator. Uh, and if it's unsuccessful, we'll wait for the page to stabilize. And then we'll try the additional locators one by one to see if we can have that work instead. And um, this really rudimentary uh, setup actually covers a substantial amount of ground to making tests far more reliable and less brittle. And so the next one I want to mention is reusable steps. So um, we implemented a form of abstraction. It's not page objects, but it's um, the ability to actually execute a test from another test. So you can take a single test and call it from somewhere else. So uh, what that looks like is this simple command called run. So you say run, and then the name of the test, and then it will execute that test. And I actually have a demo video I want to show you. So here's an example of a simple login form. So I'll just fill it out, and I'll submit. I've already actually captured this, uh, this test. So we'll go ahead and look at that. And we zoom in, we can see it's just opens, clicks, fills in text, submits. Um, but the thing that's unique is I've made, uh, I'm using variables for the inputs. And I've used, I'm calling this test. And I'm using the store command to set these values. And then calling login. I'm doing that for a happy path test and a sad path test. So then I can go ahead and make a test suite of just those tests that call the run command. And now I have a suite that just does the right thing. And if the login page changes and, our, and the tests break, I just have to go to one place now to fix it. And in, so we have, we have reusable steps. We have abstraction. Um, the other bit is modification without redo. Uh, so we have, um, we have a built-in debugger into Selenium IDE. Uh, we have the ability to set a breakpoint and run the test. And when it hits that breakpoint, we can, we can actually start to look and inspect. Um, there's, a, there's an issue with this part of the test. Why is it failing? We can look at the app. We can look at the test. We can do so much to try to understand what went wrong and why and use that to fix the test. And I actually used this last night for somebody that came to me and said, I have this issue with my test. What's wrong? Just set up the debugger, and we're able to fix it, and magic. <laughs> um, so um, the next is control structures. So um, within the idea of control structures in Selenium IDE, there's effectively two classes of commands. There's conditionals, so the ability to branch your code um, using like if, else if, else, or the ability to, uh, to loop over a set of commands as many times as you need. And you do that based on predefined uh, conditions. It's basically JavaScript. Um, you just specify a JavaScript expression. If it re returns true, then, then that's the, the thing um, that it's used. So I'll show you an example of uh, conditionals. So I have this example where it's just a simple page where there's a display ad. You're probably familiar with this. Uh, and you want to close it. It might pop up. It might not. And so we can actually set a, uh, a check to say, if it appears, we can close it, wait for it to go away. and. We run this, it pops up, it closes. The next time we load this page, it won't be there, and the test should still work. So with control structures, we can account for things like this in an application. On the flip side of that, we have uh, loops. And so we can take a repetitive task and uh, handle it quite efficiently. So in this example, there's a page where uh, you have a button, a series of buttons. Each time you click it, an element gets deleted. And so we just want to 
click these bu this button over and over and over again until there's no more buttons, and then assert that there's no more buttons. So when we run this, Selenium IDE just loops over that command over and over and over and over and over, and then once it's done, it asserts that it's all good and the test passes. So um, that's all great. Um, so say you've created tests that are well abstracted and work well and they perform well for you uh, in Selenium IDE, but you want to run them on a different browser or you want to scale them out. Um, we have the ability to do that with the command line runner. So we have cross-browser support uh, and parallel execution, um, which is effectively a simple turnkey solution. Um, so all you have to do is save your project and then install the command line runner and then run it. And then, then you get all of that for free. Um, so here's an example of what that looks like in practice. I have a simple Google search test. Just goes to Google, searches, and asserts that it found what it was looking for. And I'm just going to use that same test three times just to demonstrate the, the parallel execution. I want to make sure that this whole suite executes fully concurrently. And then I'll go ahead, make sure I save it, and then hop over to the command line. And you just run it. You pass in the capability of which browser you want, and it runs everything in parallel. And I'll zoom out real quick, and you can see all three executing at the same time. So recorded and played back in Chrome to verify it works, saved it, executed it in parallel on a different browser. Turnkey. So that's. Um, I think probably one of the biggest features that we have is the Selenium command line runner. And so, um, but another key feature I think we have is our plugins. Um, we have this ability to not only extend, you could not only um, could you in a test use JavaScript to do more within the application, but we have the ability to actually enhance Selenium IDE through the use of plugins. So. There's two different flavors of what a plugin can look like. So you either have user customizations, the ability to modify behavior within Selenium IDE to add functionality that doesn't currently exist, um, add new commands, uh, modify uh, different behaviors, um, or you have the ability to do third-party integrations, connect it with a service provider that gives you power that you wouldn't otherwise have in the tool. And it's worth noting that um, plugins work with the command line runner. So whatever works in the browser, in, in the IDE, should also work uh, in the command line runner. So um, what that, how that works is effectively Selenium IDE, uh, when, it, <clears throat> when either you're playing back or recording, it's emitting a whole bunch of events. So it, it sends out a, uh, an event for whenever you start playing a suite or start playing a test or record a command. And also with that, it emits a payload of um, details about the test, all of the commands in it, the name of the test, all of these things. And so a plugin can choose to do some action against that information and put it to use. And so. There's this distinction uh, within the between my uh, my colleague Tomer and I, where we always talk about um, standard lib, the standard library for sh is what that's short for. And when we talk about standard library, we mean all of the things that are uh, part of the core of feature offering of Selenium IDE, all of the commands that just come bundled without any, um, just you get those when you install it. And then there's plugins. So we think that plugins are a, uh, a great testing ground to uh, put a new feature out in the world to get user feedback before deciding whether or not we want to put it into our standard library. And so with that, I have uh, an example of, of one of those such things. Um, I have an example of uh, how uh, one way we could potentially implement um, adding data-driven testing to Selenium IDE. And so that's one of, a, uh, one of the 
there's a handful of features that people often request, and this is one of them. Um, the ability to take a data file, like a CSV file, uh, and then make use of it uh, in, a, in a test. And so in this example I have, I just have a si very simple CSV file with some usernames and passwords, sticking with this login example. And I have this plugin I wrote to upload that CSV file. And once I upload it, that information will be available within Selenium IDE. And then I can use the control flow structure to iterate over it and take and have the login function, the functionality we just recorded, and I demonstrated earlier, uh, use that to execute each of these inputs. And so we go ahead and run that. The single test will take the data and run over it and perform both the happy and the sad path test cases. So that's one example of a plugin where we can add functionality that didn't exist before um, in, a, in a fairly simplistic way. And I've actually open sourced this plugin. Um, I haven't made it publicly available anywhere, like on a Chrome or Firefox store. Um, but uh, if you're interested, you can take a look. You're, you can also compile it. And there's some connect, there's setup instructions if you're interested in um, giving it a go. The second one I want to demo is an integration with a third party. And um, this is how you could potentially add um, visual testing to uh, your Selenium IDE tests. And so this is demonstrating how to use the Apple Tools Eyes uh, Selenium IDE plugin. So in this example, I'm just going to capture a simple Google search test. And I just want to go ahead and check uh, whether or not there's visual anomalies in the elements here. And I also want to check that the layout of the entire page is, is good. And with the plugin, you get the, these new commands, these eyes commands. And within the, the Apple Tools eyes extension, we can configure and select uh, different uh, browser and viewport sizes, as well as different device and orientation settings. And what this does is, um, through this plugin, it'll run the test once in Selenium IDE, and then take all of the assets from the page, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, and upload it to Eyes. And it will take all of the settings I just specified, and it will render all of those permutations and then give the results of all of that. So, so that's just an example of how you can connect Selenium IDE and get a bunch of information and add visual testing where it wasn't available before. And then in this example also, we can demonstrate just there's a, they did find an anomaly, a visual issue, and we can drill in and see what the issue is because all that information is available now through this integration. And if you're interested in, in looking at that plugin, you can go to this URL as well. And then the last, uh, one of the last few I want to cover is code export. Um, I mentioned during the keynote that we now have code export. Um, and so if you didn't see the video, we now have the ability to export uh, right now to Java JUnit and it just takes the existing, either a test or a suite that you export, and then it gives you the code that you want. So all of your commands get outputted into Selenium WebDriver code uh, as a compilable, runnable Java JUnit test file. And uh, I want to mention briefly the, uh, the way that it's structured. Um, we made sure to make it as approachable as possible if people want to contribute. So each language uh, test and each test framework has its own effective package. So we've separated things out. So Java JUnit is its own package. But we also abstracted away all of the complex bits that come with generating uh, all of the code. So we have this core package. So you don't really have to worry about that. You just have to see how the, J the Java JUnit was implemented. And we hope that people 
uh, who are interested in other languages and test frameworks also follow suit. And so um, if people want to contribute Java test ng, they could do that. If people in Ruby want to contribute RSpec, they could do that. PyTest, and so on, and so on. So um, we intend to add more languages ourselves, but if people want to chip in and try to help speed up the effort, we're happy to accept contributions. And so just some quick highlights. Um, so you have the ability to export a test or a suite. And um, I mentioned during the keynote, but I'll say it again, uh, we support all commands. So not just ones that were recorded, but commands that you add after the fact, like control flow commands, like all the conditional stuff, the looping, anything that has to do with storing variables, we handle all of that. Um, and even plugins, plugins can, any plugin that gives us the code to export, we will export as well. And then we also have, um, we have, as I mentioned, built to encourage contributions, and uh, there's more programming languages coming soon. And so what I want to close with is just um, to mention that I think there's something for everybody within Selenium IDE. I think that in the uh, just getting started camp, people who are new to test automation who just want to uh, hit the ground running, they can, because the path is very, very clear. They can author tests, and then they can run them. Um, not just run them in the browser, but they can run them like in parallel, cross-browser, and on continuous integration. And if you've already got an implementation, uh, either as an uh, intermediate practitioner or somebody that has a mature implementation in code, um, there, I think there's something for you as well. You have the ability to use Selenium IDE to bootstrap uh, manual and exploratory testing efforts to uh, use, uh, use the tool to automate repetitive and redundant tasks. And also now with code export, we have, we're starting to offer the ability for people to take things that you create with Selenium IDE and export them and plug them in to your existing test automation code base. And also one nice thing, regardless of where you are in your test automation journey, you have the ability to record a failing test for a defect, a bug, and you could take that, save it, and upload it to your uh, team's ticketing system. Uh, so that way, anybody can install Selenium IDE, download that, uh, that file, and, demonstrate, and see that this issue exists. Um, so it's a good way to show reproducible bugs for fixing. And so, um, Contributions are always welcome. Um, you could file an issue, let us know there's a problem, we'd love that, um, especially re with reproducible test cases. Um, as, much, as, much as, as much information as you can share, the better. Um, feature requests, uh, things that maybe you wish the, the IDE had or perhaps that used to have, and uh, contributions to documentation, whether it's, even if it's just fixes for typos. Um, or filling in gaps in our coverage. Uh, we always welcome code contributions. And of course, um, uh, we always welcome people to give us feedback and rate us on the web stores. Um, we have kind of mixed reviews on, uh, on the web stores, and I think largely some of those uh, ratings were from the, uh, the legacy IDE. And, I, and the more reviews we get now are consistently positive, and the more that we continue to get, I think the, the more we can help get the IDE in front of more people. And so I'll close by saying I think that codeless test automation uh, is something that can be achieved um, because we have reliable and maintainable tools like Selenium IDE now that uh, have a powerful uh, integrated development environment that give us fast cross-browser feedback uh, that are extendable uh, through plugins. And there's something for everyone uh, regardless of where you are in your practice, and it's free and open source, and anyone can help make it better. And so I'll close with just one other thought, which is um, if you're looking to uh, get, um, if you're new to Selenium IDE and you want to figure out kind of the ins and outs of how to use it, then um, uh, there's a course I put together, it's free, on 
all of the functionality in depth uh, of how to use Selenium IDE. And it's, uh, it's going to be released later this month on uh, Test Automation University, which, if you're not familiar, is a great resource. It's a free resource for uh, test automation content from other practitioners like myself. And if you want to be notified when that's available, um, go to uh, testautomationu.com and enroll. And then you'll be notified later this month once it drops. All right, thank you. Um, that's, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dave. Do you have any question? We can accept one question. Oh, he, he's um, maybe in English. Hey there. Um, good talk. Uh, loved it. I, I still have the old views of Selenium IDE, so I might try it again. That's, see, that's, that's see, the best see, I could hope for. See what's changed. Uh, my question is, so does Selenium IDE um, produce reporting? Um, you spoke that it's one of the key features. That it's one of the key things. that um, It's something that's on our roadmap that we don't have a clear sense exactly what that looks like yet. Um, so, uh, But I'd love to... I'd love to pick your brain about what you're looking for. Yeah, <laughs> so, for it to handle parallelization. <laughs> yeah, but it can handle parallelization, so, yeah. All right, cheers. That's All right, it. thanks. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I um, really liked your Dr. Strangelove reference. <laughs> Thank you. Um, second, um, the company I work for really loves legacy web software like Internet Explorer 7. <laughs> um, does the, the current version of Selenium IDE um, allow that use, or is that something I have to wait for? So, so the question uh, is a good one. Um, so. It depends on, on what your expectations are. Uh, so um, you could author a test uh, in Selenium IDE, save it, and run it on Internet Explorer, but only versions of Internet Explorer that are officially supported by the language bindings. And so uh, is it IE 10? I don't know where the cutoff is now, uh, 9 or 10. Um, if only we had an expert in the house. Uh, so IE7 supports. <laughs> OK, so we have until July for IE9 and above. And then after that, it's, it's 11 and up. So um, for IE7, like in general, Selenium doesn't support IE7. And so that's not something that we could support. Right. If you happen to get it working, then that's great for it. Like, good job. Um, but <laughs> that just means you've got Selenium in general to do that. Um, so when, you, when we use the runner, it's effectively generating JavaScript code and building a framework at execution, at runtime, and using the JavaScript Selenium bindings to execute it. So it's just pure Selenium when you, when you run the command line runner. So, so basically, anything that Selenium can do is all we can do. So we can't do more than that, uh, My concern is more the recording aspect. Just recording a the... test? Oh, that's interesting. Um, at, since we're, so since we're a browser extension? No. Uh, no. Right? That's and and since, and even with moving to uh, a native app on Electron, like, we can only record where we could potentially get uh, an extension put in, because it will have to be a compendium extension to support that. So still no, unfortunately. Uh -huh. I'm Thank sorry. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. If you have more questions, please directly ask to Dave. Thank you so much. Please. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yeah. Please give big hands again. <laughs>